The Lord be with you. Thank you, choir, Pat, for that. And in case y'all didn't know, that was my mother-in-law that played the offertory. So, and Kathy, thank you this morning. I invite you to turn with me now in your copy of God's Word to 2 Thessalonians. If you have trouble finding it, it's after 1 Thessalonians. <laughs> it's just before 1 Timothy, page 182 in my New Testament. But I'm sure that's... Or it's on the screen. There you go. See, we make it easy for you. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. We'll be reading verses 6 through 13 this morning. Now we command you, beloved, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from believers who are living in idleness and not according to the tradition that they received from us. For you yourselves know you ought to imitate us. We were not idle when we were there with you, and we did not eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked night and day so that we might not burden any of you. This was not because we do not have that right, but in order to give you an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this command. Anyone unwilling to work should not eat. For we hear that some of you are living in idleness, mere busybodies, not doing any work. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Brothers and sisters, do not be weary in doing what is right. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O oh God, may we hear what you would have us to hear. May your words speak to our hearts, our mind, whatever I may put in the way. I forgot. Help us to hear what you would have us to hear, that we may do what you call us to do. And above all, Lord, that we may be the people you call us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So if you go to our house right now, and walk in the kitchen, on the counter, probably dangerously by the knives, there is a blue plastic jack-o'-lantern. And it's not because we're doing some sort of reverse thing where we don't want to do Christmas right now, so we're going to stretch Halloween or something. It's because in that blue plastic jack-o'-lantern is what's left of Cole's Halloween candy. And I'm going to let you all in on a secret. I'm sure parents have no idea what I'm about to say. Um, candy is magic. <laughs> I mean, really, it, it can almost do anything. Cole can be just pitching a fit, having a terrible time, and I can lean over and say, now, Cole, listen, if you do this, I look around, make sure Mama's not around. If you do this, you can have a piece of candy. Do you know what he does? It's like I said, if you do this, I'll write you a check for a million dollars. I mean, like his countenance changes. It's like the Holy Spirit descends upon Cole. <laughs> he gets energy. He runs and does whatever I say. And then, then if I'm trying to be sneaky about it, be like, well, he doesn't really need a piece of candy, but you know I'm not going to really give it to him. He'll come, Dada, what's up? <laughs> and so I give him a piece of candy. Now, if you're saying, Chris, that's a terrible thing, he's going to ride out his teeth. They'll grow back later. Um, but it doesn't just stop with small children. I remember, I remember first or second grade, Rucker Boulevard Elementary School, got my first real report card. Now, I don't know how it was here, but down in, in, in L.A., lower Alabama, uh, when we got report cards, they came in sort of this blue construction paper sort of thing uh, and had a picture of a McDonald's hamburger on the front. Did y'all get those here? I see Ashley shakes. You know what I'm talking about. Y'all were not blessed, I'm sorry. <laughs> because if you had an A on your report card, you could take that to the McDonald's and get a free hamburger. But it was better at my place. You all remember I said John Payer, John Wayne Payer, that was Paul. Anytime I'd get a report card, we'd take it over to Mom Paul's house, and Paul would say, for every A, you get a dollar. And if you get all A's, you get $10. So from the first grade to the fifth, I got about $40 a year. That was my annual income. All A's <laughs> on the report card. Paul always. Except for one time, I do remember, Paul said, now I'll give you $10 or I'll buy you something you want. And foolish fourth grade me decided I wanted these Beetlejuice shoes I saw at the family dollar. 
that had glow-in-the-dark bugs and skulls on them. I just thought they were really cool. And Paul took me over, and they probably cost $8. So, I, you know, when I get there, I'm going to ask him, can I have that $2 back? Um, but anyway, it happens. In elementary school, you work, get good grades, you get $10. Paul died when I was 10, so I didn't get the $10 in junior high. But I remember uh, guidance counselors and teachers would tell you, if you work hard and get good grades, you'll get in advanced classes, and then you'll go to high school, and you'll be able to hack it in high school. And when you get to high school, you work hard, you get good grades, you can take even more advanced classes, and that'll be good on your transcript when you want to go to college. And if you make really good grades, and if you do really well on these standardized tests, you might even get into a good college, or you might get money to go to a good college. And then guess what happens? When you go to college, you work hard, and you get good grades. And you get those good grades so that you might get into, in my case, a good grad school, or you might get a good job. And then you know what happens when you get that job? You work hard, you might get a promotion. You work hard, you might get more money. Guess what happens? You can work harder, and you can get more money. You might get a bigger house. You might get another car. You might get a boat. You might get a nice retirement plan. That's the way it goes. All the, now, not, some of us don't make it that far. Some of us die. Well, that's not true. All of us die. But it happens. That's true. Now, now, here's the thing. That's not new. That's probably as old as humankind. I mean, I, I can imagine cavemen. You want to eat? Well, oh, one must stab deer. I don't know. <laughs> must till the ground. It's part of the curse. It's there in Genesis, right? God says to Adam and to Eve, if you want to eat, break the ground. Grow it yourself. It's there. As old as humankind is, that's the equation. If you want to get, you got to work. That's what we say. It's, it's odd. It, it leaked over into our religions. You know that? If you study the history of religions as, as I've done before, you'll see it there. It leaks over. If you want the gods to bless you, you got to do this. If you want the gods to do something, you got to do this. Even, even the Abrahamic faith that we call Judaism, it didn't start that way. Abram was in the Ur of Chaldeans. God said, hey, Abram, I'm going to take you to a place you don't know. He didn't say, Abram, I've seen all the good work you've done. Now, James tries to make us think that. Paul tries to argue it. But that's not what the text says. God just calls Abram. I'm going to bless you, and you'll bless the nation. And even then, we couldn't get over it. We couldn't get over it. you got to get. If you're going to get, you got to work. That's what we said. Then in comes Jesus. Jesus, as he always does, turns everything upside down, inside out, and makes folks mad, and most of us don't like it. But here comes Jesus. What do we got to do, Jesus? Oh, love one another. Get rid of all the stuff that you worked hard to get and come follow me. That's what he said. I don't like it. I don't know if you do, but I don't like it. I like my stuff. I worked hard to get my stuff. That's what the world told me to do. Work hard and get. And then here comes Jesus. What do I got to do, Jesus? Well, all the stuff you worked hard to get, get rid of. Get rid of it. And come and follow me. That's what he said. You can say no, but it's there. He said it. And Paul. Now, Paul comes on the scene. He's, he's shaken to his core by Jesus on the Damascus Road. Paul starts preaching this gospel. And if we read his letters every time, and just about every letter, Paul is having to set the churches straight. No, no, don't listen to these outside people who are telling you it's about a secret knowledge. Don't listen to these outside people who are telling you you have to be circumcised. Don't listen to these outside people who are telling you it's about dietary laws. It is about grace. That's what Paul said. That's what all of his letters read like, except for the Thessalonian letters. Because the Thessalonians, the Thessalonians got it, but they got it to its extreme. In the first letter that Paul writes to the Thessalonians, the Thessalonians are concerned. Jesus said, Paul came and told them, Jesus said, I'll be back. He said it before Schwarzenegger. I'll be back. He said, I'm coming back. Uh, no one in this generation will, will pass before the Son of Man comes in his glory. And you know what happened? People died. You know, it reminds me, I read a story recently. Uh, in case you didn't know, the Cubs won the World Series. First time in 108 years. People were excited. And then I read this story about a woman whose mother, she was 93, I think it was, had longed her whole life to see the Cubs win. She had succumbed to cancer in Game 3. 
Didn't get to see him win. In fact, at Wrigley Field, they say there are chalk drawings and, and paintings all over the wall of people who mark down memorials of folks who had lived their whole lives hoping to see the Cubs win, and they missed it by that much. Of children. Children who were Cubs fans and died before they saw the Cubs win. That's the way it was in Thessalonica. Everyone said, Jesus is coming back, but here they are. They're dropping like flies. The apostles, some of them are dead. Some of this first generation of Christians, they're dead. What are we going to do, Paul? Is this stuff even real? Paul writes back to him, no, no, don't worry. It happens. People are going to die. Jesus is coming. Here's some things to look for. He uses a sort of uh, a plate-stamped apocalyptic language to tell them, look, this is what's going to happen. And they all go, oh, okay. And then Paul has to write back to them. Because what happened, they said, well, Paul, you said he's coming back. And if Jesus is coming back, why fool with anything? Why fool with it? It reminds me of a story Tony Campolo used to tell or still tells, not dead yet. Tony would talk about how he sat with his mother in an old revivalist meeting, and there was an older woman who sat in front of them, and the preacher was pacing back and forth, all red-faced, sweating, waving his handkerchief around. All the world's going to hell in a handbasket, he said. And the woman would say, Amen. And then he'd say something, Oh, this generation's terrible. They're not doing what they should. They're all out there freeloading. Amen. The preacher just kept on like that. Finally, Tony asked his mom, why is she so happy? These all sound like horrible things. And Tony said, I, I remember Mama looked at him. She said, oh, oh, sweetheart, all of those things mean Jesus is going to come back. And that's good. That's what I think happened. Paul said, don't worry. Jesus is going to come back. And the folks at Thessalonica said, oh, okay. Jesus is coming back. No reason to till the garden." Jesus is coming back, no willing to restock the shelves. Jesus is coming back, no reason to plan, no reason to go out and buy a calendar. Jesus is coming back, don't worry. Don't worry, Jesus is coming back. And so Paul has to write them. He says, listen, don't associate yourselves with these people who are idle. These believers who are living in idleness and not according to the tradition that they received from us. We didn't come doing that, Paul said. We didn't come to y'all and say, Jesus is coming back, so don't do nothing. We didn't come and say, Jesus is coming back, so just sit back, read your Bible, pray, let Jesus catch you doing that, and you'll be okay. We didn't do that. Paul said, while we were with you, while we were with you, we were not idle. We did not eat anyone's bread without paying for it because we were toiling and laboring, working night and day, not just out in the fields, but in the work of the gospel. Not because, he says, we didn't have the right. Not because we could have said, let's take up an offering. We're here to preach. No. But as an example, to imitate, he says. Because when it comes to following Christ, it's not about just sitting back and going, okay, I got mine. Let's see how everybody else does. It's not about getting my ticket to ride and just sitting back, waiting for the parousia, waiting for Jesus to come back. That's not what it's about, Paul says. That's why he says this about, Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ do their work quietly and earn their own living. Not because Paul is out to sort of uh, correct some social order and it's injustice. No, no, because Paul is trying to say, Look, look, because Christ is coming back, you ought to be about doing his work now. To be caught when Christ returns, however it may be. Not sitting idle, hands folded, head bowed, Bible open in your lap but to be about the work of Christ, about the reconciling work of the gospel, about loving your neighbor, about doing all these things that Jesus has called us to do. That's what it's about, Paul said. But some of you, some of you in Thessalonica, Paul writes, you're not doing anything. I can imagine it. I can see it, really. The gatherings at Thessalonica, there they are in church, having the love feast afterwards. Someone in says, oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, pass the biscuits, praise the Lord. They haven't done anything. They say, oh, what have you, what have you been out doing? Oh, you know, Jesus is coming back, praise the Lord, pass the ham, Jesus is coming back. Let's get on it. And the rest are out working. It's as if Paul is trying to tell them that you cannot just have a free ride in heaven while waiting back with your ticket. That the point, the point of living on in this life after finding Christ is to follow him, 
to continue in the work that Christ himself did. The work that Christ said to his disciples. He said, I've done some great things, but you know what? You, you will do even more, even greater works than these when I'm gone. That's what Paul said. Continue in that work. Because he leaves them with that verse 13. Brothers and sisters, do not be weary in doing what is right. It can be easy, as people of faith, to come to a knowledge, a cognitive understanding of what it is to be a Christian and to say, I've got it. I've got it, and this is all I need, and I don't need anything else. It can be easy to say that we've got our ticket that we have our hands stamped, that we've done everything, all the prerequisites necessary, and now it's a matter of waiting. It can be easy to do that. It can be easy to sit at idle and wait for the green light of glory to finally get up and do something. But the truth is, Christ calls us each and every moment of each and every day with each and every breath we take to be about the work of God's kingdom. So let us do it. And may none of us be found when the Lord returns, sitting and idle. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit, the one who was, is, and Lord, we know soon to come. Lord, we pray for your Holy Spirit to empower us to the work of your kingdom, that we may not be found at idle, taking our salvation and our, our gift for granted, but God, understanding that you call us to the work of your kingdom. Not in that ancient equation to work to get so that we may have something. But Lord, you call us to the work that gives. It gives to others. It gives so the world may have. So Lord, empower us by your Holy Spirit. Strengthen us to do that which you have called us to. And Lord, be with us. Be with us in this place. Speak to our hearts. Help us, Lord, to hear you guiding us and calling us ever on. Move amongst us now, we pray, Holy Spirit, in Christ's name. Amen.